This is Selma Schimmel, and you are looking live at the great city of Chicago, which is once again playing host to the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO. This is ASCO's 49th annual meeting, and this year's theme could not be more appropriate, Building Bridges to Conquer Cancer. More than 30,000 of the world's foremost cancer specialists are here, and so is the group room, making our 15th appearance at ASCO and one of our very best. Joining me now is Dr. Anil Sood, Professor of Gynecologic Oncology at the UTMD Anderson Cancer Center. Welcome. Thank you. I know you're giving a uh, educational session today, Pathways in Gynecologic Malignancies, and I would love to learn more. We hear so much about pathways and identifying new agents based on what we're learning from the molecular characteristics of cancer. What's happening on the horizon for ovarian cancer? So in this uh, educational session, we covered uh, several areas. There are three uh, uh, broad topics that, uh, that will be reviewed. Uh, the first presentation relates to the impact of uh, obesity on gynecologic cancers. We know that the number of uh, women who are diagnosed with uterine cancer continues to increase uh, in the U.S. and, and also in, uh, in the other uh, westernized countries as well. So uh, obesity uh, rates have expanded or have increased substantially over the last two decades, and that's clearly having an impact on uh, the incidence or the prevalence of um, uh, cancer such as uterine cancer. Now, obesity can uh, also impact the outcome of a number of cancers, and there are many reasons for that. Among those is that, uh, that women who tend to be obese may not be adequately uh, dosed in terms of uh, receiving chemotherapy dosing and so on. So there are many reasons. It's a complex issue, but it's something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. Obesity on its own is not a predisposing factor for developing a gynecologic cancer, is it? For uh, uterine cancer, it very much is, uh, because uh, these women are uh, known to have higher estrogen levels, and the, uh, the lower uh, grade tumors, uh, uterine cancers, or getting hyperplastic conditions within the uterus are very much related to obesity. Another pathway that uh, we will be discussing in quite a bit of detail is the role of the PI3 kinase pathway. This is one of the most frequently altered uh, genetic pathways in many different tumor types, but in particular for ovarian as well as for endometrial cancer, it seems to be highly relevant. What's changed over the last few years is that the therapeutic uh, toolbox, in a way, is much broader now. There are many other opportunities now to actually drug this pathway for therapies. Can you explain a little bit about this particular pathway? Absolutely. So this particular pathway seems to play a critical role in cell survival, as well as the, the way that cancer cells uh, behave in terms of their metabolism, in terms of promoting their growth and spread. So it plays a very, very vital role in many aspects of cancer biology. How do you identify the pathway? Well, there are many ways. There are uh, mutations or genetic changes that can occur in this pathway that cause it to become activated. And then there are many proteins within this entire chain of events that occurs inside the cell that can be measured uh, in cancer cells as a way of its activity. So pathology-wise, when you have tissue, we're not only looking at, at the tissue underneath a microscope, but now we're also looking at molecular pathology, learning about the genomics of the tumor to figure out these pathways? Absolutely. And I would just put it a bit more broadly uh, that it's more than just the gene omics. It's also about the protein omics and uh, so that we look at protein metabolism and many other aspects of, um, of the uh, cancer cells. How new is this in the area, and in particular ovarian cancer, being able to have an understanding of how proteins interact and influence the disease? It's a great question. So a lot of these genes and proteins have been known for some time, but we haven't really known what the magnitude of changes um, are in ovarian and other gynecologic cancers, but that's coming to be appreciated much better now. And part of the reason for that is also the 
uh, what's called the TCGA or the Cancer Genome Atlas Project for both the ovarian and uterine cancers that has uh, the initial papers have now been published so they've reported a lot of these kind of baseline findings that provide us with a very strong foundation upon which to build. Let me actually talk a little bit about the final presentation as well, which relates to a, a neat finding uh, that, that first started around 2005, which is use of a, use of a diabetes drug called metformin uh, for cancer applications. So we will be discussing that in detail in terms of its role, both for ovarian as well as uh, uterine cancer especially. And then we're also looking at uh, what I consider almost as repurposing drugs. So we know that chronic stress influences the outcome of cancer uh, for many cancers. So as a result of that, we've learned that uh, substances the, such as the fight or flight hormones can actually play a role in tumor biology and drugs uh, that are used for high blood pressure such as beta blockers can be effective in blocking some of these kind of effects. So a lot of these are drugs that we've used for other purposes, but they may end up having uh, very important roles for cancer therapies as well. Thank you for spending inspiring time with us, Dr. Anil Sood from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Thank you.